Well, as some of you know, I grew up in Barrie, Ontario, and moved to Chicago, lived there for a number of years, was a pastor there. But before I went into pastor, I had the opportunity to work for a, a corporation. Uh, they had sort of their head offices in Chicago, fairly large operation there, but then all sorts of things going on all across the country. I worked in the purchasing department, so centralized purchasing. There was three purchasers, and then there was the assistant to the purchasers, and then I had the glamorous job of being the assistant to the assistant in the purchasing department. My job description basically was, I just do what they ask me to do. That was the extent of what I did. And so I'm working there, and then the uh, corporation got into a little bit of financial trouble, and uh, so revenue was down, so therefore spending had to be down. And so the vice president who was over-purchasing uh, made a new directive that, that we had to type up everything that this corporation was going to buy every day, and I had to fax it over to him. He had to approve it, and then the fax came back, and then we could spend the money. So that was sort of the new directive. And so every day the purchasers would pile up all that they were going to spend. And again, there was a lot of money being spent because it was a fairly large operation. I would type it all up and send it over. Everything was going along swimmingly well until, again, I didn't have prices for everything because there was these radio stations that were out, uh, man stations all throughout North America or through the United States. But there was also, and I don't quite understand this, there were so many things going on and I didn't need to understand it. I was just doing what I was told. There was these transmitter stations. They were unmanned, but they beamed the signal so the radio stations could reach a larger audience. And often these unmanned stations would break. And so what would happen when they broke, they needed to fix them quickly. We didn't purchase the supplies. Somebody out there in the field bought the parts. They installed them and fixed them rather quickly. The only thing they did is sent us, we bought this part. So we would put it in our system, send it up to accounts payable. That way accounts payable knew that they should pay the bill because that part was bought. That's all we did. So I was typing up these parts very nicely, sending them over. This is what we're going to buy today. Really, it's what already has been bought. Well, the vice president came back and said, no, I can't approve any of the spending until you tell me how much these parts cost. So then we'd call the radio guys out there somewhere in the field, Nebraska, Colorado, Idaho, wherever they were. We'd say, we need the price for the number. They'd say, well, we, you, you don't need the price. We bought it already. We've installed it. I said, well, he won't approve the spending. And then they'd say this, he doesn't get to approve our spending. He can call the vice president of radio if he doesn't want us spending this stuff. And we're like, but we need the price because he won't approve all the rest of the spending. And so there was this tension. And again, there's no internet. You think this is such an easy problem. You just Google, you write the price on there. We didn't have access to this. So we were spending all this time trying to figure out these prices so the vice president could just put his signature on it and approve something that he didn't have any authority to approve or not. So that was sort of our adventure in redundancy there. So I remember the meeting. My boss, the assistant to the purchaser, and the purchaser had had a meeting about this. They called me in. They said, Jeff, we've got the solution to the problem in this activity of redundancy. They said, Jeff, just type up the part number and then just make an estimate on what the price was. Just make an estimate. I thought, this is a great system. You know, really what they're saying is, Jeff, just take a guess. So that's what I did. I sat down at my desk every morning. I'd type up all what we were going to buy and the prices. Then I'd get down to the radio station stuff. I'd look at the part number, and I'd say, oh, that looks like a very expensive part. You know, $500 for that part. I think, oh, that's a cheap part. I had no idea. I still don't understand what those guys were doing out in the field with these transmitter stations. So that's what I did. I would just write the part number. I'd make up a price, and I'd type it all up, and then I'd put a total at the bottom, and I'd send it over. The vice president would sign it and fax it back, and life went along really, really well there in the purchasing department. Again, you can judge me for that. I know you can. Again, it's sort of the craziness of that. I don't know. I still don't know if that was the right decision or not. So, what I had done to sort of hedge my bets on this report was I had put an estimate of the total, right? Because it really was an estimate because I was just making up some of the prices on this. So how much is this corporation spending all day? Here's the estimate. Well, one day, the vice president added up all of my totals. He was checking my math, and he came to realize that my prices were not accurate. Now, I already knew they were not accurate, because there are estimations. The only time I met the man, he came over, met with my boss. They called me in. They had gone back and added up all my reports, realized the math was wrong on all of them. They were estimating. And he yelled at me. They yelled at me probably for 10 minutes. I, I don't think I've ever been yelled at in a work environment like that since. They were very angry. And their point was, you're an idiot. You're incompetent. You can't add up these numbers correctly. Correctly. 
And I sort of thought in my head, they're just estimates. I can't say that out loud, though. And again, we were in cubicles at this time. This is not an office. So the purchaser who had asked me to make the uh, estimation, she knew what was going on. My boss, the assistant, knew what was going on. They didn't come to my aid. And so I just sort of took it. I took the yelling and took the idea that I was incompetent at doing math. And so they said, these totals need to be precise. So next day, I got my stack of things, I estimated my radio station prices, and then I created a little, you know, a little Excel spreadsheet that would summarize all, you know, that would sum it all up and give an accurate total, and I faxed that off to the vice president, and everybody was happy, and purchasing went along. And I did that for probably six months. That's how the corporation, that's how everything was approved. Now, I know, again, sort of strange, hard to process that, and again, here's what I know, some of you, have even stranger stories. In fact, many of you have even more weird stories, more difficult stories, more sort of weird environments than I do, where we're sort of working in frustration and in futility and uselessness, and you just sort of feel trapped in this redundancy, or the list goes on of stories we could all tell and the ethical challenges about the workplaces that we find ourselves in. And that's where we come this morning. We're in week three of a series called Work as Worship. And our title today is Employees. How, when we are an employee, do we work well? Do we work right? What does God have to say about that? How do we navigate all sorts of different situations that come our way? How do we navigate the not-so-ideal situations? And again, I've told my little story. Many of you would be able to top me 10 times over with some of the stories and the challenges that you have faced in your workplace. You may wonder how my situation ended. We were still in budget crunch time. The senior vice president, who was over the vice president, who was over purchasing, he sort of began to investigate all that was happening, and he came up with a solution to our budget problems. He fired the vice president. He also fired my boss, uh, the assistant. And so that sort of cleaned house a little bit, and I got a promotion, not because I was a good employee. <laughs> but because my wage was lower than the assistant's wage. And so that, that is how the, the report redundancy came to an end. When my vice, the vice president gets fired, we never had to do it anymore because there was no purpose in doing it at all to start with. Uh, so here's my hope and prayer this morning. As you would think about whatever work situation you find yourself in, we're going to get two sort of big overarching ideas, two uh, concepts two thoughts that I believe help us, help guide us through whatever workplace situation we're in to give us some perspective. And, and I hope we'll find this valuable today in the real variety of workplace situations that we find ourselves in. So we're in Colossians chapter 3. Hope you've got your Bibles to be able to open them up or to turn them on. And we're going to be in Colossians 3 and we're going to work our way down all the way to the end. For this series, we're just sort of skipping around different verses that relate to the topic as work, as worship. So this week and next week, we're in this passage in Colossians. We're going to go down to verse 22. We're going to do four verses today as we normally do, just walk our way through through what the Bible says. Uh, I'm going to read the first two verses, and then I have to qualify it. Then I have to qualify sort of what Paul is saying. Let me qualify it, and then we will move into what we can actually apply to us as employees. So let me read Colossians 3, 22 and 23 to start. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you, and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And so what we see here is Paul is writing to slaves. And so this is what I need to qualify. We have to understand slavery in the first century. Historians tell us that anywhere between 25 and 40% of the population of the entire Roman Empire could have been slaves. Some would have become slaves as the spoils of war. Some became slaves because they were children who were born into slavery or grandchildren and on down the line. Other times, some became slaves because they were abandoned as children, abandoned as babies, and they were picked up by someone else and thus became slaves rather than being left to, to the elements to die. 
other times people became slaves because they were impoverished. They had no way to pay their debts. And so they sold themselves into slavery. In that case, selling yourself into slavery is really a decision of life or death. You need to escape starvation. How are you going to feed yourself? So you sell yourself into slavery as a way to survive. Remember, there's no charitable organizations. There's no government assistance. And even as you think about that, that's happening today. There are places in the world where parents are selling their children uh, so they can make enough money to feed their family and the rest of the kids for the winter. This still happens today. And you, so you see the diversity of what's happening in the first century. It's complicated. It's hard just to straight outlaw slavery because it did serve some purpose in helping people survive. And so slavery in the first century is really a whole class of people, social, economic, political class, much different than we think of modern slavery where it was just directed to a race or an ethnicity. So some slaves would have done brutal work. Other slaves would have done menial work. Some slaves would have been cooks or teachers or even doctors. So slaves, when we see slaves in the Bible, they had great variety in the work they did and also in the treatment they received. But we certainly know that some slaves would have received good treatment, but many or some, it's hard to know, would have lived in unspeakable, awful conditions. Certainly there were some that, that had very difficult situations. So great variety in what slavery is and who is a slave and how they're being treated and why they became slave. You've got this whole third of the population in the social economic class. So what would they all have in common? It's hard to find much that they did all have in common, but let me give you one thing. It's a quote from Aristotle, and here's what he says. For that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjugation, others for rule. That was written 300 years before the time of Christ. But you hear what Aristotle's saying? Some people are born superior and some people are born inferior. Some people are just better than others. Some should rule and some should be under subjugation. This is what the Roman Empire believed. There was a value to human life. At the top was the emperor, then you had the royal ruling class, then you had the citizenry, and then you have the slaves on the bottom. They were of less human value. They were of less worth. They had less standing. And sometimes, you know, and, and again, if you were a slave, you felt that way. You knew that you were not as human you were not regarded as, as much as a human as those who were above you in the social ranking system. So sometimes, again, you read these words in the Bible, and Paul's talking about slaves, and Peter talks about them as well, and we think, oh, the Bible's just endorsing the status quo. And the reason I wanted to spend a little time on that is we understand the breadth and the diversity and how complicated the issue of slavery is. But look here. Look what Paul does. This is amazing, and you miss this if you don't understand that. Look down to the words he says. Look at the very first word. In the NIV, here's what Paul says. Here's the first word, slaves. Do you see that? That's so significant. Imagine if you're a slave, and you're sitting there, and the word of God is going to be read, and you think you're a second-class citizen, and now, now in this letter, you hear the word slaves. You're like, oh, hold on, everyone. He's talking to us. Be quiet. Shh, this is our part. You would have thought, wow. I get a part? I'm recognized? You don't think I'm a piece of property? You mean you think I'm responsible? That I have moral choices that matter? That I'm made in the image of God and have value and worth? That's exactly what anyone who heard these words would have thought. I'm not second class. I'm listed here. I have responsibilities. I matter. And so even as Paul writes these words, here's what we see. He is subtly undermining the value system of slavery because he's speaking to their dignity and worth, that they are created in the image of God, that what they do matters. And it's that little value system that's like yeast that begins to slip through the culture that begins to undermine the very value, the very institution of slavery. 
This is what Paul is doing here. Again, we look in and we think, well, of course, everyone is created equal. There's no status in who we are as a culture. Not so in the first century. And Paul is speaking to that very issue. He does it also subtly. I'll talk more about this next week. You see what he says? Obey your earthly masters. And then further on down, obey your human masters. If you're a slave, you're like, yeah, you're just my earthly master. He just lowered their status. Because what's a slave thinking? I have a heavenly father. I have a heavenly master who ultimately we are both under the same authority. And so what is Paul's advice then to slaves? What does he say? He says, do everything out of reverence for the Lord. And then look down to the end of verse 23, as working for the Lord. So here's the first big idea that I think Paul is communicating to the slaves of his day. It is for Christ that you work. It is for Christ that you work. Nothing you do is unimportant or trivial. There's no nothing tasks. Both you and your work are valuable. You are worthy. Whatever you do is an act of worship. Paul is adding some nobility to whatever these slaves were doing because he is saying you are working for Christ. You are working for Jesus. This quote is a little bit dated by the examples he gives, but I think it helps us understand this idea. You'll see the quote come up on the screen. Here's what it is. Smiting on an anvil, sawing a beam, whitewashing a a wall, driving horses, sweeping, scouring, everything gives glory. If being in his grace, you do it as your duty. To go to communion worthily gives God great glory. But, uh, take, but to take food and thankfulness and temperance gives him glory too. He is so great that all things give him glory if you mean they should. And I love this last line. So then, my brethren, live. Everything gives God glory. No matter what we do, because everything we are doing, we are working for Christ. And so therefore, live Live for the glory of God in whatever we do. This week, as if you're watching the videos along with the small, in small group time, you're going to meet a man named David, and he will say he thought he was wasting his life working in a secular profession. And what you'll hear him say in the video, here's my summary, it's not where I work and it's not what I do, but it's who I work for and it's how I work. And so as you would ponder your employment today, let me say this to each one of us. It is Christ that you work for. It is Christ that you work for. And you see, in first century, this would have been a radical transformation for the slaves that heard this point. It suddenly raised the dignity of who they are and what they did. So if it is Christ that you work for, if that's who, then how should we work? And this passage also tells us that. It tells us how we should work, first in attitude and then in conduct. Look look at the first part of verse 22. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. Now again, if you're pondering that, you're thinking some of these slaves are in very harsh conditions. Peter even says it more specifically. You'll see what Peter says when he writes to slaves as well. Same premise. Submit yourselves to your masters. You'll see it on the screen. Submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. That's what Peter is saying. That's what Paul in many ways is saying as well. Now, as we read these words, Paul is not endorsing the system of slavery He's just merely saying, if you're a slave, here's how you have to operate within it. There's not a lot of other choices they would have had. And so Paul's not endorsing this kind of treatment, but he's just saying, here's how you need to operate within this system. So then, and again, some of your Bibles, as we try to move this to present day, some of your Bibles may have at the top of this section heading, you know, employees and employers. If that's in your Bible right now, here's what you have my permission to do. Just take a pen and just cross that off because it's not synonymous, right? These things are not exactly the synonymous. We're pulling out some principles, but today just to blanketly say that we always need to submit to our employer is a misunderstanding of 
of the situation that the people found themselves in. Here's the difference for us today. We have freedom. Here's the thing you can do. You can quit your job and not be killed for it, right? You're allowed to do that. Slaves could not do that in the first century. You have opportunity to do that. You also have rights that Canada gives us. You all, we also have laws that govern our em- employment. And again, I know there's tension in how we figure all of these things out. But if you go to work this week and your boss starts to think that he is a slave master and pulls out a whip to give you some lashes on the back, you don't need to think about these verses. Just call 911. All right, that, that's, again, Paul's not saying in every situation, submit. No, because he's speaking to a different audience. But yet we still need to ask ourselves this. What's the principle? What's the principle in this regard? Certainly very different situations. What's the principle? I'm going to put the principle in negative form because I think it helps us understand it more, and it's an attitude principle. Again, there's so many situations that's hard to quantify. Should I, do I submit here? How do I approach this? You, we all know the complications of that. But here's the attitude. Here's the attitude statement. I'll say it just in a phrase. God does not bless a rebellious attitude. God does not bless a rebellious attitude. What does it mean to submit or to obey? It means that we are expected to respect the authority that is over us in employment. We are hired to perform a particular task for a particular wage. The employer sets the standard and the expectations for that employment. And we may not like it, we may not agree with it, everything they say and do, but the, uh, the employee is asked to respect what the employer has said. This is what is biblical and what is pleasing, to submit to the authority over us. God never blesses a rebellious attitude. And so in this point, we're looking internally to see our attitude. And you're going to watching the videos this week, you know when you get an opportunity to learn this? You get an opportunity, if you've got a great boss, you're like, oh, this is easy, no problem. You get an opportunity to learn this when you work for a boss who's not worth submitting to, who's not worth obeying. And then in those moments, you really get to see what your motive is. Is it profit? Is it promotion? Is it, am I just rebelling? Or is it that I'm working for Jesus? I'm working for Christ and I care about his glory and his honor. So that's the attitude that Paul, I believe, is speaking to here, the best way to take this principle from slavery and apply it to us as employees. But he also goes on to talk about our conduct. How should we conduct ourselves? And you see that there also in verses 22 and 23. Let me just illustrate this with a Dilbert Dilbert, uh, comic. So you're going to see the end of the comic in a moment, but the comic starts out in... Dilbert's this workplace comic, and him and his friend are going to their boss, and they say these flattering words to their boss. Oh, boss, we find you so fascinating. And the boss is like, oh, really? And they're like, oh, yes, you should go on Twitter and leave us little messages about all your daily activities. The boss is sort of warming up to the idea. And then they say, oh, it would make us feel so connected to you as our leader. And I dare say it would motivate us. And so the boss then begins to think about this and thinks this is a wonderful idea about how he could be tweeting about all the daily activities of his life to encourage his employees. So he goes off to do that. And then the last scene of the comic that you will see come up on the side screens, there are the two friends sitting with their feet on their desk. And one says to the other, where's idiot boy now? Meaning their boss. And then his Dilbert says, in the parking lot, no need to look busy just yet. You see that, right? You know, we're just going to monitor his interactions so we don't have to work very hard at all. If you remember this comic, it's the exact, it's the exact thing that Paul is addressing in these verses. Look what he says. Look what he says. When should we work? Not only when our boss's eye is on us to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. What do we see there? They're not working that way. They're they're not working that way. You know, hey, where is he? We'll just slack off. So what Paul is saying as employees, when should we work? We should work all the time. Not slacking off when we're alone. 
We should work from the heart. We should operate with sincerity whether the boss is present or not. We've agreed to work for a set time to receive a prearranged wage, and we are expected to fulfill our end of that agreement, to work all the time. And then the second thing Paul says is this, is how should we work? And then he says to work wholeheartedly, not with our feet on the desk. We are to be given to the task at hand, not doing just the minimum requirements. Christians ought to be the best workers in attitude, in dependability, in integrity, in faithfulness. They should be hardworking. To not operate that way, Paul is saying, is sin. And I know for many of you, if you're, if you're in a business or you're in a place where you're hiring people or looking for people or with coworkers, here's what I hear over and over again. Here's what I hear is there is no great people to hire. In fact, what I hear for most employers who are hiring people is this. If I find an above average person, in fact, if I find a mediocre person who will come on time and leave on time and work hard, I'll hire them up so quickly and employ them. And if I wanted to speak to our Canadian culture today, we, we in some ways, and again, more, many of you know more this than I do, it's hard to find people who will work wholeheartedly. What Paul is calling us here today as employees is that Christians should be the best workers. Why? Because we are working for Christ Amen. himself. And what you'll hear in the video is that people evaluate God by the quality of our work. Our work makes a statement about the worthiness of Jesus. So the way we use our time and our integrity and our effort and the quality of our work reflects back on the God we serve. Because again, the first idea is that we work for Christ ultimately. Now there's a second idea in the second two parts of the verse. And as you might be thinking of this, you may be thinking, wow, Imagine being a slave working in unspeakably harsh conditions, and now I'm just told I have to submit and obey. There, there's really not much else Paul could say if you sort of begin to think that through, and you might say, what an awful life. What a waste of a life. Why would anybody stay in that situation? And Paul then begins to address that in verses 24 or 25. Let me give you the second principle that he wants people to understand. Here it is. You'll see it on the screen. It says this. It is from Christ that your reward will come. It is for Christ that we work. But now what we're going to see is Paul is going to say, it is from Christ that our reward will come. Look down to verse 24 and 25. Since you know that you receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there will be no favoritism. So Paul is saying the reason we work wholeheartedly is because we receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Now, this is incredibly good news for first century slaves. Because again, they were treated like property. They had no rights. They were lower standing. And they certainly, under Roman law, would inherit nothing. They had no inheritance. And now Paul says, you have an inheritance. You have a reward coming your way. Just think about that for a moment. If you're a first century slave working in unspeakable, awful conditions, and you're thinking the Lord is keeping a record of these things, and one day he will reward me for my faithful work. No matter what my lot is, no matter what's happening, this is an internal perspective. You know, last week we did a uh, a short prayer time through the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And it was the second time we've done something like that. And my learning as we did both of those hymns was that the last verse in each hymns we did, It Is Well, and the one we did previously, both pivot to look for eternity, to say, let us live with eternity in mind. And I think that's so different than we live today often. Oftentimes, we just get so focused on the here and now when what Paul is trying to do is pivot those who were in slavery to look to the future where there was something great. 
there was something so much better. And so whatever was happening in this life, that there was an eternal inheritance they would receive, that there was a reward. This week in the video, you'll watch a great story from a social worker at a hospital. Seems like she's in a very difficult work environment. And she says this, very rarely do I ever get a thank you. But then she says, but I'm not working for people. I'm working for the Lord and the reward that he will bring. And this is what Paul wants to communicate to the people of his day. It is from Christ that your reward will come. Now, there's another side of this. Let me quickly do it. Verse 25, if we rebel, if we slack off, if we work half-heartedly, sin is sin. And Paul is saying God notices those things. There's no partiality. There's no favoritism. And so there's his, a clear warning there, but also there's a challenge, but there's also an encouragement. There's also an encouragement here. He, he Notice the word, the first word, anyone, anyone. Because if you're a slave, you're like, well, this is not fair. I'm working hard, but what about, what about everyone else? They're not doing this. They're slacking off there. They're rebellious. What about my slave master? Paul says, anyone, anyone. There's no favoritism. God sees, God sees, and will one day reward everyone appropriately. And so in some, this could be a challenge for others who heard it. It would have been a great encouragement knowing the God of justice. Here's my summary on these ideas. It is for Christ we work. It is for Christ our reward will come. Here's my summary. God pays so well. That when we get to eternity, we will, have, we will have wished we had served him even more. God pays so well that when we get to eternity, we wish we will have served him even more. Now, one last thing. Those are the two big ideas this morning. There's one last thing we need to sort of answer. And it really helps pull the whole service together from Jacob's baptism all the way to this moment. What is our inheritance What's the reward? Is it worth it? Right? And it's in this idea that helps us understand how much we understand the gospel message, how much we understand what Christ has done for us as we come to the question, what is our inheritance? Well, in one answer to that question, we could say this. It's many things. Your inheritance is many things. Your sins are forgiven. We receive a new heaven and a new earth. We're united with loved ones. There's the absence of pain and sorrow. We receive a glorified body. We rule with the angels. We inherit the earth. And the list goes on. There's quite a large inheritance for all those who are in Christ. But let me say it this way. If we had all of those things, those mean nothing. Those mean nothing if God is not there in eternity. What Paul has said earlier in the book of Colossians is this. Our inheritance is God. He is our exceedingly great reward. God is what we get to be in relationship with him, to know Christ. That is the reward that we have. John Piper puts this in question format, and let me just process this through. This is like sort of a litmus test to see how much our, we understand the gospel, but also how much our hearts are inclined to the gospel. Here's how John Piper says it. You'll see the quote on the side screens. It's a question. If you could have heaven with no sickness... With all the friends you ever had on earth, and with all the food you ever liked, and with all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed, and with all the natural beauties you could ever see, and all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, and no human conflict or any natural disaster, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ was not there? See, it's that point that brings us to the gravity of this. Could you be satisfied with with all of that? If Christ was not there, do we see him as the ultimate reward? Do we see him as our ultimate joy, our ultimate satisfaction? And if we see him this way, then the other two principles naturally happen. We naturally work for him. We naturally will then be gravitated towards the reward. So, would you be satisfied with eternity if Christ was not there? There's two ways to answer that question. One would be, it's a yes-no question. One would be, yes, I'd be quite happy with that. And if that's sort of the honest gut reaction that you're saying in your heart today, here's just the road I would point you down. You have not yet seen the depth of your sin. We've talked about sin in the workplace. 
today. But, but that list could go on. You have not yet seen the depth of your sin. You have not yet seen what Christ has done for you on the cross. You've not yet seen your separation from God, his anger and wrath towards your sin, and you've not yet seen Christ stepping in for you to die on the cross for your sin. And wouldn't you say this morning, Jesus, I just don't see the value in you. And would you say, God, would you open my eyes to see the depth of my sin and see how I need you and see what you've done for me? And as God may be gracious to open your eyes and see that this morning, Would you not call on him? Would you not turn from your sin and trust in him? Jacob, thank you for your baptism today, a demonstration of a moment in your life where you came to trust in Christ, to turn from your sin. And that's what you declared today. Jesus is Lord. He is worthy. If I never got anything else but I had Christ, that would be enough. And so our question, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ was not there? If your answer honestly was yes, I've given A challenge to you today to turn from your sin and trust in him. For many of the rest of you, here's, I think, your answer. No, I wouldn't be satisfied, but not as much as I'd like to say. No, doesn't it reveal sort of where our true loves are? That that our love is not fully in the presence and the beauty and the glory and the greatness and the mercy and the grace of Christ? And if you're in that category today, which I think we all would be, all we could love Christ more, here's the good news. There's grace. There's grace. There's grace. And wouldn't we leave today with a heart more greater full of Christ? Yes, rejoicing in our inheritance and the rewards he gives, but just rejoicing in who he is and what he has done for us. Let us grow in that. And as you grow in that, then as we go out into the workplace, it is Christ that we work for. It is from Christ that our reward will come. It's that heart of love for him that keeps moving us forward. Let me pray for us. God, you see the broken world we live in? And God, just so many diverse and complicated situations. God, in some ways, we're glad we don't live in the first century, but God, in other ways, Lord, you see what we deal with every day here in our own century. And so, God, as you speak to us today, Lord, about how we operate as employees, oh, God, may you help us. Lord, give us wisdom. God, give us perspective. And then, God, ultimately, we pray, Lord, that we would have a love and a greater revelation of who you are and what you have done for us. So we pray this all in the name of Christ. Amen and amen. One of the greatest testimonies we have during the week is how we work, how we work. And as you're working for Christ this week and someone asks you about that or asks you about your faith, would you share Jesus with them? There's lots of opportunities. And so we end every service with reminding ourselves that we've gathered now and now we have a mission. Now we have opportunities and so harbor, we are sent.